So over the past few weeks, I've really just been craving some old school video games. You know, like a while back, I finally played through the Gears franchise with a buddy. A few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of replaying L.A. Noire. And most recently, I've just found myself diving back into the Master Chief collection. And all of it, it's just kind of had me wondering, like, why? Why is it that in the face of great and amazing brand new games like Black Myth Wukong or the Black Ops 6 beta that everyone's raving about, why am I instead opting to play stuff that's more than a decade old? And look, I could give you a ton of surface level reasons, from nostalgia to just not wanting to drop big money on every single new game that pops up, but the truth is, I think there's a bit more to it than that. Like for example, and of course while this isn't true across the board, but back in the day it just felt like video game companies had their priorities a little different. It seemed like first and foremost they made their money by making a memorable experience with some fun as hell gameplay that was so amazing it was able to stand the test of time. Whereas today, there just seems to be a much larger focus on all the monetization strategies strategies, through the use of endless battle passes or live services that only serve to capitalize on that gamer need to grind and stand out amongst the crowd. But look, all that video game introspection just to say that when it came to this newly released Space Marine 2, I was really just hoping it was going to be able to scratch that same old school video game itch. And I mean, after watching the trailers over the past few months, it really did seem possible. You know, like from the focus on that co-op and linear campaign to just the over-the-top horde system that had you fighting literally hundreds hundreds of enemies at a time. Overall, I was just really hoping for a game that was going to bring me something similar to those days of playing Army of Two or the Halo 3 campaign with a buddy if you know what I mean. And so now, the question of the day is, does this game live up to that? Is this the flashback to an older classic age of shooter video games that I was hoping for? And moreover, more importantly, is this just a good game for the age of 2024? Well, today my friends, let's figure that all out together, and let's dive into the truth behind Space Marine 2. Alrighty dude, so first things first here, I want to make it known just right off the rip that I have a very limited experience with the Warhammer universe. You know, honestly, my knowledge extends to that first Space Marine game, that Doom-like bolt gun game, and of course, listening to Henry Cavill rant and rave about the franchise on my YouTube shorts. And now don't get me wrong, I've always thought that Warhammer was sick, it always looked so cool as someone being on the outside looking in, but it's just never been something I've dove too deep into. But look, all of that just to say that I want to come to this game with a bit of reverence, because for a lot of people out there, Warhammer is their passion, and me, I'm just a visitor. You know, I'm just a gamer who thought that Space Marine 2 looked cool as hell, and so the point is, I'm not coming to this video or this breakdown with the perspective of, is this a good Warhammer game? And that's because, obviously, I would be really ill-equipped to do that. There is just so much information out there that I don't know. And so instead, what I really intend to do here for the video is, I want to break this game down for the sum of its parts and really just grade it that way. But anyways, man, with all that groundwork now being laid out, let's actually dive into this Tyranid squashing chaos-filled experience. And so first off here, before we dive into any of like the specific facets or the nitty gritty details in the game, for the uninitiated out there, let me just give you the quick little elevator pitch. So for Space Marine 2, it's a game that takes place about a century after the first installment. And so without ruining the first game on its own, all you really need to know is that after the events of Space Marine 1, our main man Titus found himself a bit disgraced by his brothers and arms. And so due to this, between both of these games, he was sent away to work with a new group where he was made a soldier known as a Black Shield. And so at the start of Space Marine 2, we begin our journey as Titus, still being that Black Shield, going off on a mission and then quickly being ripped to shreds by a Carnifex. But thankfully, before he's able to bite the dust, Titus is then saved by some of his old Ultramarine buddies. And from there, he's then put back together like a Frankenstein's monster, and then, maybe out of pity, but more likely due to desperation, are protagonist then has his title of Ultramarine reinstated, and then from there, his main goal is to help assist in wiping away this ever-growing Tyranid invasion. But now, before we dive too much deeper into the intricacies of the story itself, first let's just kind of break down the gameplay. And so for me at least, I think the really special thing about the gameplay in Space Marine 2 is, on the surface level, it seems extremely simple. I mean, oftentimes it's really just shoot anything that moves. But now beyond that, there is indeed this underlying layer of depth that creates an experience 
sense that super easy and fun as hell to pick up and start, but slowly can become really hard to master and slowly gets a lot more intense, satisfying, and cinematic in a way that I was never expecting it to. But now, to break that down a bit more and just starting with the basics, throughout the game you've got a ton of different weapons you can choose from. From melter rifles that, as the name suggests, are great for melting the flesh of your enemies at close range. But you've also got a multitude of different bolt guns, from the small single shot rifles to the heavy duty bolt gun that's akin to something like a minigun in this universe. And so when it comes to the weaponry at your disposal, I'll say that each and every one of these guns is damn fun to use and all of them have their kinks and quirks that make them great for certain places styles or scenarios. But I mean, let's just keep this all short and sweet here. The guns are guns, it's nothing too crazy, they'd all work as you'd expect them to, and like I was saying, they all feel great to use and man, while it is truly such a damn satisfying feeling to blast these enemies and watch them slowly disintegrate from your barrage of bullets, but more than that, at least for me, where the gameplay truly shines its brightest is with the melee combat. And now, that comes down to multiple different factors, like just on the base level, you know, these melee weapons, from the greatsword or the oversized combat knife to the iconic chainsword or thunder hammer. You do have quite a few options to choose from and each of these different weapons have their own combos and methods of attack that you gotta learn and use. From the chainsword where you can unleash a flurry of light attacks and then chain it together with a shoulder bash or an unstoppable stomp that sends enemies flying backwards. To the power sword that can chain states from either being really fast and great for one on one duels with big enemies or instead you can supercharge the damn thing and make it quite a bit slower but turn it into a horrible killing machine due to its wide, big, damage dealing sweeps. But now, all this surface level stuff aside with like the combos and the melee weapons themselves, it's important to note that regardless of the type of player you are, whether you could care less about a thunder hammer and a chainsword, no matter what your preference, the melee combat is almost unavoidable and that's because of the way that the health and armor system is set up in the game. And so while the parameters around this can shift a little bit just depending on the mode and difficulty you're playing on, but generally speaking, when it comes to the missions, your health itself itself is not going to regenerate on its own. Instead, you're going to have to use an ability or a stim shot that you can find around the maps to bring that red bar back up to 100%. So if you're playing this game in a smart way, you never want that red bar to be affected at all because it can be a huge, massive pain in the ass to refill. The stim shots are really in short demand, so your first line of defense in protecting that gracious health bar is the one below it, that armor meter. Essentially, the way it works is as long as you have some armor, when an enemy attacks, that's what's going to be depleted first. And while this armor meter can indeed refill on its own, but it typically takes a really long while to do so, and so it's not something you have the time to wait for in the heat of combat. So instead, the only way to really stay alive, the only way to keep that health meter afloat and that armor meter consistently filling is by pulling off some badass executions and finishers, which in turn refill a slight amount of the armor. And so overall, because of this sort of gameplay design, it just creates this really cool sort of dance where with every enemy encounter, unless you're some video game guy, God, you're gonna get smacked around a bit, you're gonna lose health, you're gonna be on the brink of failure a lot, and I mean, just with the sheer amount of enemies the game throws at you, it's just inevitable. But now, because of the way that this health and armor system is set up, it almost strictly promotes that over-the-top aggressive Rambo style to the gameplay. And so, at least for me, I just thought this system made every encounter feel so damn intense. Like, it always feels like you're in some sort of last stand, you're always on the back foot, taking on waves of literally hundreds and hundreds of enemies. And you always know that the only way forward, the only way to get through it is not by running away, it's by fighting your way through the fire. And so listen dude, you know, the point is, when it comes to the gameplay, when it comes to the combat here, it's just like I was saying, on the surface it does seem really simple. You know, oftentimes it's just hack slash shoot 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 on repeat, but the better you get at the game, with the bigger and badder your foes get, and with the more enemies it throws at you, the more you just begin to realize how much depth and skill is layered underneath the surface. Like, Seriously, man, you may not really pick up on it just from watching the gameplay, but there is a fair amount of strategy required here. And there are so many different split second decisions that you're going to have to make through your playthrough, like how much damage you're willing to take on, from which enemies you want to take out first, to just how you manage all your equipment, from bullets and stim shots, and just all of it, from the guns and melee weapons to the health system, it just created a gameplay loop I could never get enough of. But hey, now that we've gone over the basics of the gameplay, and since we've covered that core to the combat as well, I think it's best we start applying that all to the three core pillars of the game, the three different modes that you have at your disposal to play through. And so, just for the sake of spoilers, I do want to save all like the campaign and the story stuff for the end of the video, but for now, I think it's best we go over the operations mode, because this whole section of the game serves to be a bit of an extension of the campaign itself. 
And the basic way they work is they place you as the backup squad for Titus, where he'll be sending you off to take care of side objectives while he's doing his own thing in the main story. But now, for how these operations actually work, this is where you start getting into the variety of the game, because you have multiple different classes to choose from. From a sniper with cloaking technology, or a heavy tank with a big bolt gun and a holographic barrier, to a bulwark with a shield in one hand and a sword in the other, or the assault class with a jetpack and a heavy melee weapon that you can use to fly up in the air and ground slam down to wipe out waves of enemies in one fell swoop. You know, there is indeed a lot of variety to these character classes themselves, but as well to the way that you actually have to play as them. You know, for me, I don't know why, but I was absolutely obsessed with that thunder hammer and jetpack combo, so I almost always ran the assault class, but there is truly a little bit of something for anyone in these classes. And especially once you start playing with different people online, you can find some really cool synergy and strategies for the missions at hand. Like just an easy example being that me and my buddy would usually run the bulwark and assault class in tandem, and so me being the assault jetpack guy, I would usually take the lead and start by taking on the first wave of enemies while he would stay back and fight off the bigger guys that were charging in, but eventually we would get overwhelmed, we'd be pushed back together just by the sheer numbers we were up against, we'd be back to back at low health. And then all of a sudden, because my buddy was the bulwark class, he was able to drop that armor charging banner, giving us the extra boost to our health pool that we needed to smite the rest of the wave and make it out alive. But as well, there's a lot of other plays you can pull, like maybe you run a heavy and a sniper together and you guys stay back behind the holo shield and the heavy takes care of the grunts while the sniper goes for headshots on the bigger enemies. And you know, none of it's like crazy out of this world innovative, but I thought it was the perfect setup for some multiplayer where no gamer is able to be a jack of all trades. Instead, in order to become victorious in any given mission, you really do have to work together and you have to use the strengths of your class to keep yourself and your buddies alive. But now beyond that, the variety in the mode stretches a bit beyond just the whole class system. Like just for a basic example, while there are are only six operations as of now, but once you start ramping up the difficulty, things can begin to change a little bit, from new bosses that will randomly show up to bigger waves and all that. And so while you are indeed playing the same missions over and over here, but at least to me, I didn't really think it ever got that boring. Now of course, I would get used to the missions after a while, but due to the awesome combat, the variety in the class system, and with how varied the enemy encounters can play out on different difficulties, it always just felt fresh and fun. But now with all of that being said, even with all the variation that we've talked about, like it or not, if you've got nothing to work towards, then this stuff is going to get stale, it's going to feel pointless really quick. And so the question we got to ask here is, how does the whole progression system work for the multiplayer aspects? I mean, is it satisfying enough to keep you going, to keep you playing? Well, at least for me, I think what they did here was pretty damn cool. So like I was saying, there are different difficulty levels, but the reality of it is the setting you choose has a lot less to do with your skill level as a gamer, and instead it's actually a lot more based around the actual class character level that you have. So like, just to break that down a bit more, slowly but surely, as you play through the operations mode, you'll begin to rank up your character. And through that growth, and upon every rank up, you'll start to unlock this currency that you can then turn around and spend on a skill tree. And this will start to unlock you little different perks for your character from something like faster cooldowns on special abilities, or just more damage under certain circumstances. But as well, it's important to note that just beyond ranking up your character, the weapons you use the most also rank up alongside. So let's just say that, like myself, you're using the Thunder Hammer over and over. Well, eventually, you'll be able to unlock new perks on a skill tree for that weapon. But on top of that, you can also unlock whole new versions of the weapon altogether that will then provide you with cool new different skins and just higher stats across the board. And so the point I'm trying to make here is the way that the operations are set up, it's all about this slow power creep. Your character is progressively getting stronger and stronger, your weapons are actually getting better and better, and you're getting more skilled at the game all alongside it. And all of that together, it just builds up to the point where you eventually work your way up to the next difficulty and all the new boss encounters, and you do it all just by grinding the game. And so getting back to the question I was asking about the whole progression system, yes, this game does truly give you something to work for on multiple different levels, and I absolutely love that dude. You know, in most games, grinding sucks, it sucks the fun out out of almost all of it, but here, to be able to see and feel your character actually getting better, to be able to go up against even bigger hordes and even harder bosses, it all just made for such an addictive gameplay loop that I love time and time again. But now, just beyond all the skill trees and beyond all the perks, when it comes to the progression system here, there is a little bit more we gotta touch on. Because as you start to complete more and more operations, and as you start to unlock more and more currency, you can then use all of that money on your customization for your space marine. So essentially, 
essentially, the way the whole armor system works is you have two different factors to your customization. First of all, there's all the different trinkets and medals that you can put on your ultramarine, and they're typically earned just by playing the game, not by spending your currency, not by pulling out your wallet. No, instead, they are simply earned just by seeing that victory screen, whether it's in PvP or the operations mode. And so, at least to me, I think the really special thing about setting it all up this way is that it creates this system where the badass top tier players, they look like it. I mean, once you start to get your character's class to a really high level, you're just going to be decked out head to toe with all these different medals. And so when you see another player that's all tricked out like that, it gives off the same sort of feeling that the recon helmet did in Halo 3, where you're going to see some guy walk out of the armory or in a PvP match just draped in chains, adorned with skulls, medals, and a Spartan style helmet to boot. And you're just going to know right off the rip that, holy shit, this guy's a badass. He's been playing the game way longer than me. You know, he earned my respect. But no, just putting that all aside, you know, secondarily, there is another aspect to the customization. Of course, the colors. And this is where you're actually going to be spending the main majority of your currency when it comes to the customization. And I gotta say, man, you know, the amount of control they give you with all the different emblems and colors that you can put on any specific piece of your armor, it's just impeccable. You can change everything from the color on individual arms, to your legs, to your chest plates, to the metal lining on every single piece of armor. You can add in different emblems and change their color, and all of that stuff, it's just a tap of a button away and right there for you to screw around with. And so due to the amount of control you have here, a lot of people out there are just going to be cosplaying as their favorite Space Marine chapter. Like I've seen a ton of players out there running those salamander colors, but for me, I just wanted to create something new. So like in my mind, I made up this backstory where my assault guy, because he's a melee focused class, he's got this right red arm to signify his strong hand. And you know, sure, it is kind of simple, it's a little dumb, but I thought it was a cool little touch of my own. But look, anyways, the point I'm trying to get across here is that when it comes to the customization here, it's just fucking top notch. There's no better way to put it. And dude, I really just got to give the developer some props here because the way they made this customization, it's done so in a way that we haven't seen for years. You know, the top tier badass players don't just look so awesome because they spent 50 bucks on a skin pack. No, they earned that shit. And so when you unlock anything, even down to just a small little trinket that you get to place on your right leg, it all feels so much more satisfying because every piece of it is earned. But hey, you know, that was one really big bit of a tangent. I mean, I started off wanting to talk modes, and here we are at the tail end of customization. So at this point, I think it's going to be best if we take a little bit of a step back, and now that we've got the operations and everything that entails under our belts, I think we should start to move into the PvP mode. And so look, man, as much as I hate to say it, this is the only small kind of sore spot I have with this entire game. And real quick, before you start getting any little preconceived notions thinking that it sucks, that is not the case at all. At least to my eye, it just kind of feels a little bit rushed. It doesn't feel like there's quite enough in store for the player here. Like for example, as of now, there are only three different modes you can play through, and they just boil down to Domination, King of the Hill, and Team Deathmatch. But on top of that, there are only three maps that you can play through on repeat, and each of them, none of them really feel that memorable. None of them are that unique. They all just feel really bland to be honest. And so just because of that, because there is no real spice to this game, because there is nothing to the PvP that makes it special, it really does just make this entire mode feel like a bit of a side project that was probably tossed in to just grab the attention of the players that are a little more competitive focused. And now again, I don't want you to misconstrue or twist what I'm saying here into thinking that the PvP sucks because it can be fun at times indeed. But for me personally, it just kind of felt like this mode more than anything was just a good palate cleanser between the campaign or the operations. You know, it's just not something I'd be able to sit here and recommend that you drop hours upon hours into or just buy this game because of it. And that's just simply because when it comes to Space Marine 2, this game is at its best in that linear, mission-based, co-op focused setting. You know, just to play this game for the PvP would be to miss out on the very best aspects of the entire game. At least that's how I see it. But look, dude, now that we've gone through the basics of the gameplay, from the combat to the armor customization, and since we've gone over that amazing operations mode and the decent enough PvP, that only leaves us with one more thing to cover. Of course, the campaign, the big and bombastic action-filled Space Marine story. But real quick here, before we dive into any of the details, I do want to give you a little bit of a spoiler warning, so if you don't want to hear anything about this game's story, then just use the timeline bookmarks down below to skip to the next section. But anyways, dude, you know, let me tell you, going into this game, I 
didn't have a ton of huge expectations for the story. You know, as long as it was a decent enough backdrop for the gameplay, I was going to be happy. But man, believe it or not, the story here, the narrative, the plot, the character arcs, all of it just absolutely blew me away. I mean, of course, it's no Last of Us or anything like that. It's a far more simple and straightforward tale. But nonetheless, you know, the whole overarching plot of Titus and his men not really knowing how much they should trust each other, for their bond to kind of grow and then splinter and then grow back together, for it to then culminate with the whole ending where they all start to trust and believe in each other, to the point where they start trying to, like, sacrifice themselves and they throw themselves in the face of danger for each other. It was just so awesome to see as, like, a simple war story you know. I just absolutely loved it. But now, just to get into some of, like, the character arcs here, man, I really love Gadriel. I mean, he kind of reminded me of Raiden from Metal Gear, so I automatically had a bit of a predisposition to think he was cool. But beyond that, I just really liked watching his whole character arc, you know, getting to watch him wrestle with what he's supposed to believe in, with if he's supposed to trust this new mysterious lieutenant that took his position. And on top of that, with how little Titus lets on about what's going on or what actually led up to this whole situation, it starts to build up a lot of doubts in Gadriel's mind. And it gets to the point, it ratchets up the tension between these two main characters where it ends up culminating with this little battle between them where Gadriel literally tries to blow Titus's head off. And then of course, once they're able to reconcile, it was just a really cool scene to see Titus sit there and kind of break it down like, yo Gadriel, it's my fault you felt that way, man. I'm your lieutenant and I didn't need your worries. I was being mysterious. I made you have doubts. And then for them to be able to all come together in that final battle as brothers in arms, man, it was just so fucking cool. But as well, just another really cool scene with Gadriel I can't go without mentioning, you know, there's this part of the game that kind of calls back to Leandros in the first game where Titus concludes like, hey guys, we gotta jetpack the hell out of here and then Gadriel comes up and he's like yo Titus the codex does not support this action but still I cannot wait to do it and for me it was just one of those moments where I was like oh man is he really about to pull a Leandros and then he said that and I was like fuck yeah man that's my boy right there Gadriel was so damn cool but look man you know beyond the basic characters in the narrative one thing I do really want to commend this game's story for is the constant over the top spectacle that they're able to pull off like there's just so many moments where I was staring at the screen in awe and yes some of it was because of the graphical beauty being bestowed upon my Xbox. But moreover, this game just knows what us gamers want and think is badass and cool. Like, let me just give you a couple of my favorite examples. Like, that part where you're flying through space, dodging the exploding pieces of the ship. That shit was so damn cool. It was like the scene from Halo 2 where Chief is literally surfing a nuke in space, but this time you get to control it. But even better was that whole section at the end of the game I keep bringing up over and over, and it's that part where you walk out to the Scottish guy giving the whole rally pep talk to the the other soldiers. And then from there, you and your men walk out with that ultramarine banner in hand, having that final standoff with hordes of enemies teleporting in. Oh man, I can't explain it any better than just saying, that shit made me feel like I was vibrating in my chair. I was so damn hyped. Like sure, maybe this is gonna make me sound like a bit of a dork, but it was one of those video game moments where it made me want to stand up out of my chair, throw my fist in the air, and say, hell yeah man, let's go. And so look, dude, when it comes to this story, like overall, I don't have a whole lot to say because it is really simple and many ways it can just be boiled down to this is the redemption of Titus. But simple or not, I just gotta admit it. I loved every damn second of it. I absolutely loved every aspect of the campaign. From the characters to the different enemies that pop up to just the overarching plot in general. You know, bluntly, this is one of the best shooter campaigns that I've played in a really, really long time. And you know, just bringing it back to what I was saying in the intro, I've been really craving that old school video game style and dude, Space Marine 2 did deliver on that hand and foot. And not in the sense that it just feels like an old and janky 360 game. No, instead, like I was saying, it just feels like its priorities are far more different than what we're used to nowadays. You know, first and foremost, Space Marine 2 is a game that's all about its gameplay, and hell man, the gameplay here is next level fun. There is never a dull moment pretty much ever, and it does that. It creates that fun-centric vibe by just focusing on the little things that matter the most. From setting up an absolutely ingenious health and armor system that ropes itself back into the combat in a way that makes every enemy encounter, every combat scenario feel so damn intense. You know, it always just brings you right up to the brink of death, right up to the brink of failure. It makes you skate by by the skin of your teeth time and time again. But as well, and kind of taking a step back here, when I say the game focuses on the little things, there's a lot more to it than just that. Like with something as simple as the Tyranids, if you pay attention throughout the game, you'll hear people talking about how they're this symbiotic organism controlled by hive minds of sorts. 
Tyranids. And so if you apply that to the battlefield, if you take on and smite a Commander Tyranid, well, lo and behold, you broke the synaptic link and all the drones around you fall to the floor. But as well, there's just a lot of times where you'll be walking around this virtual world and you'll be blown away by all the little intricate details strewn about. From a guy weeping in front of his tank that's been blown to shreds, or just being able to look across a bridge at other space marines being waylaid by enemies, and then just being able to whip out your gun, blast the enemies from hundreds of meters away, and let the other comrades live to fight another day. And sure, all of this stuff in the grand scheme of things, it isn't that big of a deal on its own. But once you start to tie in all those little things together with a game that provides a downright amazing story and campaign experience, but as well, once you start to layer in some amazing multiplayer missions on top of that, which by the way, aren't just repurposed goods from the campaign, like there are no joke full blown and spectacular boss battles that you will never see or play if you don't go through the operations mode. But just to keep pushing that even further, once you start tying in an absolutely awesome and fair progression system that keeps you coming back time and time again, and more importantly, never asks anything of your wallet, but still gives you everything you could hope and ask for when it comes to customizing your marine and both their look and abilities, you know, all of it together, it is just downright awesome. You know, Space Marine 2, it is just a gamer's game. And at least to me, it is borderline perfect. This is easily my game of the year, and I just cannot wait to see what comes next. And that, my friends, with all that laid out there, with all of that now said and done, that is the truth about Space Marine 2. Well anyways, dude, that is the video. That is gonna do it, and just right off the rip here, let me say, seriously, if you made it all the way to the end, all the way to the outro, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for taking the time out of your day, and I really hope you enjoyed the video I put together here. But hey man, you know, right about now, you've been listening to me ramble on for pretty much half an hour, and so at this point, I got a couple questions I wanna toss your way. I wanna hear from you. So first and foremost, have you played this game? And if so, what's your take on Space Marine 2? Did you love it as much as I did, or were you not as much of a fan? Or you know, Maybe you haven't played this game at all yet, and if that is the case, did I convince you to give it a go here in the video? Are you gonna buy it now? I kinda hope so. I mean, I would really recommend this game like full price and everything. But look, dude, you know, no matter what you're thinking, regardless of what your take is, I really do wanna hear it from you, because at the end of the day, we're all just passionate gamers with different views and standpoints of our own. So be sure you drop your opinions down below in that comment section, and let's start a conversation about Space Marine 2. But um, you know, yeah man, I guess that's gonna do it for me. That's the video, and I gotta get the hell out of here. It is 2.25 in the AM. I feel like I'm about to die. I am so tired. So if you really did enjoy the video and you want to support all that hard work, then please drop a like down below. It really means a lot when you do that. And if you want to go the extra mile to keep supporting my channel, or maybe you just want to see more videos like this one, well then be sure you press that subscribe button and stay up to date with all the latest content. But yeah, that is it for me. I'm going to go to sleep. I hope the rest of you have a really good rest of your day. But uh, yeah, man. Peace. Deuces.